Oliver Wendell Holmes said there are three types of people, those who make things happen, those who watch what's happening, and those who haven't the slightest idea what's happening. Filming this video today for those who are going to serve time in federal prison and who want to make things happen. Hi, this is Justin McPrenny with White Collar Advice, and I'm grateful you're allowing me to better prepare you for what life uh, could be like inside of a federal prison. I'll touch on a number of things in this video, from you know, visitation to the chow hall to, to jobs and staff, but it is by no means an exhaustive list. I'd be writing and talking about it you know, for days. Um, to learn more about life inside of a prison, you can get a copy of my book, Lessons from Prison, which is free. But for now, I'm going to transition into life inside a federal prison from my perspective, but I'll also weave in uh, some, what I, some of what I've learned from working with hundreds of white collar defendants since my release from prison. I want to weave in some of their stories uh, and those with whom I did not work because there's too much information online that is anecdotal. In other words, it's one person's experience and it might be true, but people take it as if they, they'll read it and presume that's going to be that their experience or they'll read that prison is boring and they presume that it's going to be boring for them or they'll read that you cannot run a business in prison that's not true. I ran and grew a business ethically and transparently from prison and it changed my life. So the goal of this video is to open your eyes into what's possible and also debunk many of the misperceptions that others have about life inside of a federal prison. And for me, I got going very early every day in jail, 5 a.m. I was either awake by 5 or the guard would be walking by and the keys would be banging on their thighs and um, you know, you'd wake up and the count cleared at five and I'd have a cup of coffee and I'd have 20 or 30 minutes to think while the rest of the dorm slept. I'd begin to collect my thoughts for the day and my day was non-negotiable inside of a federal prison. It was my routine, my structure, enabling me to prepare for all the obstacles that, that would await me. So I liked waking early while the dorm slept and I also liked using the restroom in privacy without getting too graphic. I remember my first full day in prison at 8 a.m. There were 20, 30 guys in line to use the restroom, each holding a roll of toilet paper and I said I just don't want to go through that again so waking early was best um, for me from there at about 6 30 every day I'd roll down to um, the chow hall I went down to chow nearly every breakfast uh, while I was in prison to leverage off some of the good resources that they would give you at Taft camp um, the more they would give you and that you could use you wouldn't have to purchase in the commissary because we only had a $290 a month spending limit in the commissary it's now 360 so I'd go to the chow hall at 6.30, sometimes I'd you know, sit with friends, sometimes I'd sit with prisoners that I did not know, but I always kept to myself because I was a little you know, obsessed with what the rest of my life would look like because I went to prison. Indeed, after I got adjusted in federal prison, I wasn't really worried about life in prison. I was worried about what the rest of my life would look like. So because of that, I spent my days in prison. In fact, I know many of my clients now do the same. With earbuds in, making it quite clear they're not to be spoken to. It's not disrespectful, it's not rude, maybe it's a little aloof or standoffish, um, but unless you're that way anyway, aloof and standoffish, I don't think I was. People are gonna get like, hey, this guy's in a routine, he's doing his own thing, let him be. And even though I was serving a short prison term, only 18 months, I think from the beginning, guys appreciated my efforts for a few reasons. I never complained. There is nothing worse than a white collar offender who surrenders for a three or four year prison term or 18 months or a year and a day. And that from that first day, second or third day, they're immediately spending their days complaining about the prosecutor, you know, the, their attorney who might have you know, screwed them or whatever it was. Then you have a nonviolent drug offender serving 20 years or 10 years because of our ridiculous war on drugs. It is also a nonviolent crime. And then you can immediately get checked when you're there for four hours when you're complaining about your crime. So I was very quiet, and I was grateful, actually, and I knew that it could have been worse. So I stress all of you to not complain, to recognize you're stepping into an environment where men have lived for 2, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and I understood that because I understood my environment before I wanted others to understand me. Um, indeed, there were men, and I remember this from my early weeks, who literally, it's like they were watching paint dry. They would just you know, watch TV all day until the mail call came. Or if the New York Times didn't come that day, it would throw off their whole routine. They were beholden to the, the prison for their happiness and for their needs. And I knew early on that my experience in federal prison would be miserable if I obsessed over what I could not control. So when you're in federal prison, you might not be able to control your bunk or your job or the people with whom you work, um, the days that you visit there are aspects of imprisonment that are uncomfortable. 
I chose to focus on what I could control, namely my attitude, the time that I woke, my exercise routine. And that adjustment pattern empowered, empowered me on days where I was lonely and I missed home and I missed women and I missed my toilet and I missed my parents and my dog and just freedom. And you have to focus on what you can control. That empowered me and I think some of the men respected me for that. And I was in my own little world and that world took me to the track every day at 8 a.m. Now there are scores of men in prison who exercise and I admire all of them. Um, I chose to run and I ran from 8.15 to 10 mile, 8.15 to 10 o'clock nearly every single day, nearly probably around 10 miles each run. Some days I did the bike. Now there are a number of men doing other exercises. There's bocce ball, there is volleyball, there's soccer, there's basketball, there's tennis. I chose to avoid many of those group activities because I feared that I'd get hurt. Uh, medical care in prison is lacking despite what prisons might tell taxpayers. Uh, it's very tough to get hurt and get the treatment you need and fully recover. And also I didn't want to be beholden to anyone else's routine. Like I said, you know, my routine was non-negotiable and I didn't want to be beholden to softball practices three or four nights a week. So I could run at a pace that I can control and I didn't have to worry about getting hurt by playing soccer or basketball and I didn't feel obligated to go to practices during the week. That was best for me. You have to decide what's best for you. I did notice on the inside that a number of men quickly succumbed to this peer pressure. I mean, it exists in society, it exists in federal prison, of succumbing to this peer pressure of feeling obligated to hang out with, with certain people, of feel obligating to join an exercise group or educational programs because someone might have helped you upon your surrender. You know, I didn't want any of that, and I made quite clear when asked that I appreciated the opportunity, especially, I don't know, I might have mentioned foolishly that I played baseball at USC, and I was by no means a star at USC. But by hearing that I played baseball at USC, every day for like a month, these guys pressured me to play softball until I finally got to a point where I'm like, dude, I'm sorry, I'm not going to play softball. I'm not going to be a professional softball player when I come home. I got a lot of stuff to work on. I'm sorry. And so the guy was like, dude, relax, take it easy. You're going crazy or you're running too fast. You're going to get hurt chill a little bit, you know, slow down until you get closer to the house, which is prison parlance for relax until you get closer to the halfway house. That's part of the reason I had so few friends. I didn't want to have to defend my routine. I had a couple of friends in prison, Michael Santos, my mentor, and Andrew Alchek, and we all learned from, from one another. Andrew got me into running, and of course I learned more from Michael than I can talk about in this video. Two friends in prison, and I didn't want friends in part because many prisoners spoke to staff. In fact, when I got to prison, I formed a quasi-friendship with someone. He introduced me to a few guys. We walked the track. And that first week, I saw that he was talking to staff. And I was like, oh, no. My daughter loves to say that. Oh, no. And I realized this guy's three cubicles away from me. And I now have to essentially blow him off as a friend because he spends every afternoon talking basketball with a guard. And you don't talk to staff. At least I didn't. Some prisoners better associate with staff. I don't know why. Maybe they just don't view themselves as criminals, so it's easier to speak with them. So I didn't. I didn't want to be friends with people to begin with, and I didn't want to certainly be friends with guys that spoke to staff. In part because there are informants on the inside, especially some of your friends. I mean, there are prisoners that will curry up to guards, who do it because they want more visitation or additional halfway house time, um, and other reasons. So. Uh, I didn't have many friends for that reason. You can have as many friends as you like. And not talking to staff, I liked that I laid though. They didn't know my name. Um, I wasn't ever bothered by them. I wrote few cop outs, which is when you put in a request. I did put in a cop out after four months to leave the kitchen, which is where I was for the first four months at Taft Federal Prison Camp. I put in a request to become uh, an orderly, which they approved. I put in a cop out to move bunks which she approved when I surrendered to Taft Camp. Many of the new prisoners are at the front of the dorm. And because of my proactive adjustment and not complaining and doing my job, laying low, avoiding the prison hustle, or well, I did a little bit of the hustle, not getting caught for it. I was too stupid. I did it too quickly. Um, because of my proactive adjustment, I moved further back in the dorm, which made life easier for me. Because when you're at the back of the dorm, there are longer term prisoners who are more respectful and courteous and the lights go out a little bit sooner. So I did write a couple of cop outs, but not like those prisoners who seem to write them every single day. Um, I didn't appreciate some of the pettiness from staff. And again, I'm not complaining. My journey was very easy relative to others. And I developed a lot of perspective and tolerance while in prison because I realized the opportunities that I had squandered. I became very introspective while there. But some of the pettiness from staff 
shook me. For example, if our dorms weren't clean enough, they would remove all of the microwaves from the microwave room so we couldn't cook. Or the warden put up this policy that said you can only use the typewriters um, for your legal cases. So we could be in the library and there's 10 open typewriters that nobody could use. Apparently he didn't want to cover the cost of the print or whatever it would cost to fix the typewriter. I don't really know. So again, some prisoners would become very fixated on the institution making these decisions and it would derail them. Where for me, I just looked at it like, again, this is something that I cannot control. Much like you couldn't control the commissary shopping. Um, you know, when I shopped for the first time in the commissary, I had my long list. There was a long line. It's nerve wracking that first commissary shopping. There's something strange about it. I just remember thinking I was so anxious for my first shopping. Had my long list, my ID card, and I walked in and I handed them uh, a prisoner who worked in the commissary my um, my list and the food came out and you have a bag there and you're like throwing it in as quickly as you can it does say there's a big line big sign before you leave the commissary make sure that you have everything no refunds I never did that I wanted to get in I wanted to get out sometimes things were missing I never complained sometimes a banana looked like it had been rotten for four months it's all good I'm not going to complain unlike others who might have or who wanted to return certain things do not complain if you don't like the avocado it's all good you're going to be home soon I never did any of that also don't shop too much that first time because it can look like you're rich okay if you go and you spend your whole limit in that one shop and you're carrying everything back to your cubicle be moderate um, be patient take your time and it'll be fine okay it can be tough to run out of your limit early on those months you go to the chow hall a little bit more than a little bit more than you'd like so I'm often asked about the, med, the, the medical care in prison. An experience tells me, and this is across the board from clients of mine who have been in camps and lows and my personal experience, again, despite what the prison system might tell you, the doctors there, they lack sympathy and they certainly don't treat you as if, they're, as if you are their patient. They care about keeping costs down and they will purposely misdiagnose you. I don't know where they, met, where they went to medical school, if they have licenses, but I assure you they didn't go to Harvard or Yale. And for those of you who are going to prison, you will see that soon enough. Just embrace it, try to avoid you know those injuries because I have clients and like I said myself who were misdiagnosed or they didn't want to properly treat us I slipped in the kitchen I developed a hernia I expressed it to them they wouldn't help me I've had many other clients get hernias knee injuries back injuries um, I had a client a few months ago say Justin I followed every piece of advice you have given me it's really you know emboldened me on this prison term the one piece of advice I did not take was playing organized sports and basketball because I rolled my knee I will never be the same Make sure others know that organized sports are a risk because if you get hurt, they will not treat you. So just be aware of that. You can complain if you like. I chose not to and I came home and I had a hernia surgery at UCLA and I just said, you know, it's part of the journey. So you're not going to get the medical attention that you need. The dentist, I too wondered where he went to dental school because he looked at my teeth for about four seconds. I asked him a question. He said, okay, you're gone. You know, get out, move on. So that was my experience with dentists and doctors. In prison, of course, the prison system is going to tell you they treat you wonderfully and your needs are going to be taken care of. Uh, it ain't so. It's just part of the journey. Stay healthy. See the dentist before you go in. Maintain a healthy diet. Avoid the cakes and sugars and cookies they give you in the chow hall. Avoid the ice creams that you can purchase in the commissary, both for your fitness, but also because if you get a tooth, they ain't going to fix it. And you'll see a lot of guys in prison walking around toothless. Just be proactive. Be careful. And, you know, back to being proactive. I'm often asked, how well did I sleep in prison? I'm a light sleeper. But one piece of advice that I've given my clients since 2008 that has worked is exercising your ass off because it will help you sleep through anything. And it did for me. You know, waking early and running eight, nine, or 10 miles, or I have a client that cycles for 90 minutes every day. I have a, a, a female client in Alderson in West Virginia who walks for 90 minutes every morning. And they all say the same thing. By exercising early, hard, and often, I sleep like a baby that night when the dorm was loud and noisy and lockers are slamming and people are cooking. So the exercise will help you sleep, which is integral to living productively um, you know, inside of, inside of a federal prison. Living situations on the inside. Some prisons like Lompoc have open barracks, some have pods. At TAF camp we were in cubicles and I had an upper bunk. Some people with medical conditions and due to age are going to be in a lower bunk. I had an upper bunk and I liked it because it kept me from you know, spending time there during the day. You will find some people in prison will sleep all day, I guess regardless of the bunk. 
You'll find some people watching TV all day or gambling all day, exercising all day, um, complaining all day, working hard all day to come home. But by having an upper bunk, it kept me from getting up there to rest. And also, kind of a germ freak, that's one thing I worried about, going to prison, what would the bathrooms look like? They were clean, they were private you know, shower stalls, they were better than I had expected. Um, I was not one of the men who, when, when they would turn off the faucet, would use like a napkin to turn it off or on. I said, this is my world, this is my life, I'm not gonna do that. Um, but many men do for fear of germs, which I get, because you do get sick a lot that first two or three months as you get acclimated in this big dorm with the air and being around so many men, it's just part of the, part of the experience. Um, so I didn't want a lower bunk in part because people could come on sit on, sit on it and they could have walked the track and it's just not a good idea to sit on somebody else's uh, bunk to begin with. Um, I'm asked a lot about jobs and the people with whom I worked. So while I can't, while we can't control, you know, certain parts of imprisonment like our bunk and our job, we can control our attitude. And there are times I failed, and I've had clients reach out to me and say, Justin, I can control my environment like you taught me, but there are times I work with some people who drive me insane, and they're not people that I would associate with. And that's where on the inside, it takes a great deal of discipline. And I didn't do that at times. As I wrote in Lessons from Prison, there was an experience when I was leaving the chow hall uh, while finishing my job, I did pots and pans, where I had two prisoners arguing about the existence of the Holocaust. And I remember, if it's, it's not just because I'm a Jew and, and you're totally offended by it. I mean, what imbecile won't acknowledge that the Holocaust actually existed? And here I am working three feet away from someone who I had not a friendship with, but was respectful with. And now I knew until I had served four months in the kitchen and I had like, I don't know, three months left that I was going to have to work next to this person who actually spoke with logic, he claimed, arguing about the existence of the Holocaust. And that's when you feel like you're in prison. You feel like you're in prison when you call home and they don't pick up. You feel like you're in prison when you run out of phone minutes and the visitation is over and you wish you could just call home to make sure your family's home safe. That's why you got to save your phone minutes, two, three, or four minutes for those visitations because there's nothing better than calling home knowing that the people that visited you are there safe. I did, was terrible with my 300 phone minutes. There were times that I would visit and I would have to wait till the following month. Um, I, I, knew, I knew they got home safely, but there was just such value for me in being able to speak with them on the phone. Or losing a loved one in prison. There's nothing worse than a few times you hear a prisoner's name getting called down to camp control. And you just feel for them. And hearing that a mother or father has passed away. And um, it's just tragic. And if the sentence is so long, they won't let you go to the funeral because it's a security risk. Or all of these reasons, that's when you feel confined. And that's where life inside of a federal prison can be very, can be, can be very difficult. And as much as you might prepare or plan... Um, it's not easy. And that's why visitation is not always great in prison. Uh, I visited nearly every Friday on the inside, but with only 300 phone minutes. And I didn't have, there was an email while I was in prison. There is now. Um, use the core links or JPay at TAP. And for disclosure, I have clients that say they're on the email system too much, not because of cost, but, it, but because it's distracting all of what they're trying to accomplish on the inside. So like anything else, you want to be moderate in your tasks in prison, whether it's exercise, reading, writing, TV, sleeping, there's got to be moderation. But for me, with no email and just 300 phone minutes a month, I did a lot of snail mail. That's how I wrote my blogs and book. Visitation. And you'd be surprised to learn that visitation can be bad days because that's where you get some bad news from home. And it's really contingent on you, the prisoner, and the tone that you have set for that visit. If you roll down to visitation and you're complaining, and you're frustrated and you're complaining about life on the inside, it sets the tone for that whole visit. Now, as someone who speaks about ethics, I have all over the country, I'm not one to encourage lying, but this is a time that you have to lie. You have to lie on days where you call home and you wanna cry or complain. You need to say, honey, it's all good. I'm working hard. I'm going to be home soon. This part of the process is easier than the time that I spent fighting my case. So if someday you are in federal prison and you are calling home from that pay phone and you wanna complain or bitch, Instead, perhaps you'll think of Justin Paperni and say, I'm working hard here. I miss you and the kids. I'm proving worthy of the opportunity. I'm enrolling in all of the education that they're giving me here. I'm working hard to get additional halfway house time. I've made the right people. I love you. I cannot wait to see you on Monday or Friday. I only have five phone minutes left this month, honey. I love you. I'll call you back. Talk soon. There were days when I'd call home and i lied to my mom or to my friends uh, in telling them what life in prison was like. So I hate to tell you to lie, but lie, because if you say it enough in time, you might believe it. 
And I did loathe some of the prisoners who would call home and make it harder on their family because it's hardest on them. And I recognized that very early. And my clients recognized that very early that while we surrender to prison and we're coddled to a degree by this prison system that could really care less about us and they could care less if we sleep or watch TV all day, there's no accountability. Our family's working and supporting us and raising the kids. So, you know, I didn't have a lot of friends in prison and I certainly wasn't friends with a gentleman who played cards all day and hustled all day and watched TV all day. And he'd go make that phone call after the 1030 count cleared and complain to his wife about how hard Taft Camp was. And that if it wasn't for her, he'd transfer to an easier prison. It doesn't get easier than Taft. Then he'd get off the, oh, then he'd close the call by saying, honey, can you send me a few hundred more bucks? And he'd use that money to pay off his gambling debts. And I remember thinking, this has got to be harder on the family. This has got to be tougher. And I never wanted to go down that road. Okay, I want to make clear, I've talked about some prisoners who complain, but equally, there's just as many men on the inside who use all day, every day to prepare, despite circumstances that were much more difficult than mine. As I mentioned in the video I filmed why I went to prison, I touched on many men taking pleas because the odds of prevailing at trial are low. Many take pleas despite not being guilty because the length, the, the idea of such a lengthy prison term if convicted at trial are just too much to bear. And I have such admiration for those men because well, many of them shouldn't be in prison, but they're preparing all day, every day, and not succumbing to a negative and hopeless environment. They're preparing despite some of the injustices thrown their way. It was easier for me because there was no gray in my case. It was black and white. I clearly crossed the line. But for some prisoners who chose to spend their afternoons in the library, reading, writing, taking college education courses, or in the quiet room, you know, were writing employers to try to line up jobs in the halfway house, is very inspiring to me. And in many ways, I tried to mirror their adjustment and learn and learn from them. Uh, so I, I wanna really stress that, that there are ample opportunities in prison to grow that network and to be totally productive um, because you are going to have a lot of time, which for me and many of the men at Taft Camp was uh, in the afternoons, many hours alone prior to that 4 p.m. count um, to prepare for our future. So I have a lot of respect for them and I wanted to clarify that so many good men prepared um, each day, despite circumstances that were, you know, difficult by any measure. Um, there's a lot of online chat rooms that will tell you prison is boring. Um, I've written in the past that the highest value for some prisoners is boredom. I suppose it can be boring. And if you want to fall into that category of making things happen, you've got to learn the, to avoid the, bo the boredom that is so pervasive inside of every federal prison. You'll, you'll feel it on holidays where you miss home. The weekends, it can be very tough because it lacks the structure of the week. And more than ever, you have, to, you have got to find a routine that is best suited for you while recognizing at some point the doors are going to open. And for me, I tried to find, and I encourage my clients, and I encourage you to try to find a win-win inside of a federal prison. So a win-win for me might have been, you know, teaching. Uh, many men in prison don't have their GED. I helped many obtain their GED by basic arithmetic and math and English. That was a win for them. The win for me was the sense of perspective and the good feeling that I had knowing that I was contributing and giving back. And rather than complain or bitch about my environment, which at times I did do, believe me, I'm not totally immune to, you know, having lived inside of a federal prison. I was able to create that win-win and I understood my environment and I avoided many of the altercations. And indeed, when I would, you know, I worked in the quiet room a lot with Michael Santos. And I would frequently watch the way that new prisoners interacted with others. And shortly into my term, a new prisoner surrendered. And the irony in prison is a lot of people don't do their job. And this white collar offender was admonished by a, a, a low level drug offender for the way that he was doing his job. And the irony was this prisoner, the other prisoner didn't do his job at all. So here he is, you know, getting on someone about not doing his job well enough where he didn't do his job, period. So this is where you have a dilemma in prison because there are some inveterate criminals in prison that don't care if they go to the shoe, if they get transferred, if they go to a higher security prison, they got 10 years left. For many of my clients, prison is but a blip in their life that should be preparing you for richer experiences upon your release. Had this white collar offender understood that, he wouldn't have snapped back or argued with this guy and said, you don't even do your job. Luckily, it didn't you know, grow into an altercation, but it very easily could have. Now, if you know my work, I don't prey on vulnerabilities or fear. 
There was very little violence inside of a camp, but I did see some fights and part of her gambling issues primarily. And um, you know, a lot of complaining or some guys that just go on and on about the money they made, the people they knew. The irony is the people that claim they had the most money don't have five bucks to shop in the commissary. So some of those people can get on your nerves and because of that there were some fights and altercations, but it primarily had to do with gambling. As I said earlier, I could talk for days and days about life inside of a federal prison. And I encourage you to read Lessons from Prison in part because I write about this metaphorical you that Michael Santos introduced me to, and this is the way that it works. So you're gonna to surrender to prison and you're nervous, you're anxious, you have, you're leaving you know, society, you're leaving your family and freedom behind. You have all these anxieties about what life is like on the inside. Then you get there and you begin to settle in. You begin to get accustomed to this world of confinement, to the showers and the toilets and your job and separation and visitation and your exercise routine and the cliques that you form. You begin to get comfortable and acclimated. And then as you work your way down this metaphorical you, you're going to be at the bottom of this you. And that's when you're really dialed into your prison term, right? That is when you know you've already moved to the best bunk. If you've adjusted well, you have the best job. You're dialed into your exercise routine. You're dialed into your programming. You should be preparing for the obstacles that await you. You know, it's the most comfortable part of your prison routine at the meta metaphorical part of this you at the bottom. But as you begin to reach the end of your term, and it doesn't matter if it's a year and a day, 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, as you begin to ascend the you, the same anxieties come back. The anxieties about, why well, I'm going to have to pay bills. I'm going to have to pay rent or my mortgage and health care. I'm going to have to deal with a probation officer who's going to supervise me for two, three, or five years. Um, I have to pay back my criminal restitution. I've lost my licenses. Or how am I going to support my family? And then a number of men at the end of their prison term, both drug offenders and white collar, have the same level of anxiety that they had when they surrendered. And I saw that from the very beginning, some men turning down the halfway house because they didn't want to transition to society because they weren't ready. They had wasted their time on table games and, and football or soccer and TV and ESPN, and they weren't ready to transition. So I'll close this long video with something that impacted me. Moderation to begin with, don't exercise for 10 hours a day. Don't watch TV for 10 hours a day. There is gold in moderation. It's got to be balanced. That's one. Two, begin ascending the you, the metaphorical you, the day that you surrender to prison. If the day that you surrender and as you live your life on the inside, you are focused on your family, on your routine, on developing new skills of overcoming the obstacles every day, for every day that you're in prison, if you can do that, you won't feel that anxiety as you reach the end of that metaphorical you and you won't be scared to release you'll be thrilled to welcome and embrace your family as the doors open up for you and as you transition to or fur furlough i should say to the halfway house um, look i'm very grateful that you've chosen to watch this long video life in federal prison can be awesome it can be terrific it can be can be productive as i've said before i'm not insane i'm not glad that i served time in prison but i wanted to make things happen i wanted to emerge to opportunities and a network that would believe in and support me, not because I asked them to, but because I had earned it. Avoid the wrong people in prison. Avoid the hustle. Begin ascending that you. Avoid staff. Don't complain if you get a bad banana in the commissary. Don't complain if you got a guy in the chow hall complaining about or questioning the existence of the Holocaust. Don't complain about the pettiness of staff or informants that might try to create trouble for you. Lay low, live your life, and you will emerge different than the troubling differently than the troubling data uh, suggests it will. Thank you for your time, and I wish you all well on your journey. Thank you.